Today we're going to have a look at precipitation titrations, in particular the Moore method as an example of one. Now before we dive in, we're going to explore a few things. We're going to explore why do we want to do precipitation titration. Um, we're going to go through some analogies to understand it better and then use some, some real exam style questions to um, make sure that we are confident with the precipitation titration. Let's get started. So what? So you know why might we want to do a precipitation titration? So the most common kind of problem that we're trying to solve with a precipitation titration is we have some kind of solution, right? We have some kind of solution, and there's some amount of like chlorine or iodine inside, or um, one of these things, typically chlorine, and we don't know how much there is, and so we're trying to figure out how much chlorine there is. Okay. Now we can't do a normal titration with acids and bases because chlorine is not an acid or base. Thankfully, chlorines and iodine and these other halides, they do precipitate, right? So if you remember, there's a few things that they will precipitate with. Um, if you remember PMS, lead, mercury, and silver. Now, lead is toxic, you're going to die. Mercury is toxic, you're going to die. Silver is not too bad. So we use silver to precipitate the chlorine, okay? So that's the general idea behind these precipitation titrations is that we form, is that we use silver, the precipitating of silver and, and that chlorine together to precipitate out something. Now, there's actually a bit of a friend to the precipitation titration and their name is the gravimetric analysis, which we've mentioned in a previous video, right? But just to give you a bit of a quick briefer of, of the gravimetric analysis, right? They're actually very similar kind of mechanisms. In gravimetric analysis, you also add a bunch of chlorine. In fact, you add, you, you don't just add enough chlorine, no, sorry, sorry. You don't just add enough silver to perfectly match the chlorine. You add way too much silver, right? So you add loads and loads of silver. So if this is your your beaker, you add loads and loads and loads of silver, right, it's a lot of silver, and what that's going to do is that is going to create a little pile of silver chloride at the bottom, and the idea is, okay, I'm going to take out that silver chloride, put it onto my little scale, and because I know how much it weighs, if I can say that it weighs, let's say, one gram, I can figure out, therefore, if I have the mass of silver chloride, I can therefore figure out the moles of silver chloride, and therefore, by the molar ratio, if there's maybe one mole of silver chloride, there must have been one mole of chlorine. So we could do the gravimetric analysis method. In fact, it's a lot simpler than the precipitation titration. So then why don't we? Well, unfortunately, when you actually do this experiment, you don't get this nice clump of like precipitate at the bottom. Silver chloride is a very, very finicky guy, and instead of being a nice solid thing, it's, it's going to be kind of like this, this, this murky, it's going to be very uniformly dissolved, and it's going to just look like um, a slushy, where you can't really see a particular chunk of material, it's all mixed in there and it's very hard to filter it out. It's very fine, it'll go through your filter paper. So we can't act, it's not very easy to actually take out the chunk and weigh it. Precipita precipitation titrations remove that vulnerability. What a precipitation titration does is that we figure out exactly how much silver we need to add, right, to neutralize all of the silver, okay? So if, let me give you an example. Let's say I have a burette and I have the conical flask below. Now, let me say that in my conical flask, I have a few chlorine ions, right? Let's say I have five. Of course, when I'm doing this experiment, I don't know that there's five, but just between you and me, let's say that there's five to make our understanding easier. Now, in our burette, I'm going to elongate my burette for a second, and um, I'm going to put in my silver ions, right? Silver. Of course, it's not just silver, so it might be like silver nitrate, um, but we can kind of, the, the, the nitrate will do absolutely nothing in this whole process, so we can just pretend that it's just silver there. 
Okay. So we have a. Uh, so we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, nine silver atoms. Okay. So we have nine silver atoms at, at the start, and so five chlorine ions. Okay. So let's kind of run through what might happen. So open up my my bureau. The first silver ion comes out. Ooh, plops into the solution. It reacts with the chlorine to form a precipitate. So let me just quickly move to the side. Forms a precipitate here. So now there's only four chlorines left. The second one comes along. Ooh, does the same thing. Forms a precipitate. Great. The third one comes along. Ooh, forms, an, forms a precipitate. The, the fourth one comes along. Precipitate. Fifth one comes along. Ooh, precipitate. Okay, fantastic. We used up all of our chlorine ions, right? So, but the thing is, right? But the thing is, from your perspective as an, as an experimenter, you don't know. So the, the, the question we're really asking is, when does the um, end point occur? Right, that's the question that we're trying to answer because we, because obviously, you know, in here I've drawn these atoms so big that we can see them, but as a human being, we can't see atoms, right? So you might just keep adding more and more of these silver atoms, right? But we should stop because we've completely neutralized it all. So how do we know when to stop? Well, that's where, you know, the same kind of problems occur in a acid base titration and we use an indicator to solve that, right? So so we, we use an indicator. So, so let's actually explore how a precipitation titration actually would occur. And to do this, let's kind of just run through an example and then learn the steps as we go. So let's say I have a burette. And we have a conical flask below. Now, a conical flask has our chlorine inside, right? Has our chlorine inside that we want to analyze. Let's say there's five chlorine atoms. Of course, we can't see atoms in real life, so you wouldn't know how many chlorine atoms there are, but I'm just drawing them in to make sure that it's easy to understand. And, there's some, and let's say we have a couple silver atoms um, lined up here as well. Okay, we have nine silver atoms in there initially, right? So, so let's just say we have five seal atoms in and nine silver atoms. Now, now let's think about a, a normal titration. So you, you might have your sodium hydroxide here and your HCl. You need to know, I mean, you need to know when you should close the burette. And we use that, and we do that using an indicator, right? So we have an indicator, and for the most, and for most titration, the indicator is going to be chromate. If we have chromate acting as our indicator, we're going to draw it in here. We can draw it in as a. It's actually a bit of a yellowy substance, um, but maybe that's a little bit hard to see. That's our chromate, it's acting as an indicator. Now, okay, let's see what happens when we add in a silver atom. The silver atom drops in. Okay, now the silver atom has two choices. It can either choose to react with the chlorine, or it can choose to react with the um, chromate, right? So does the ch chlorine want, it, want the silver more, or does the chromate want the silver more? And so the answer comes with KSP, and we're going to explore this in a bit more depth with um, the, the, the next um, uh, video after this, which goes into the, um, the advanced bits of precipitation titrations. But as an, an analogy, you can imagine that because chromate has a higher KSP than that of silver chloride, so the, um, what that means is that kind of, I like to imagine this as if you have some like fat Americans, right? And you have some normal Australians. If you give them both a burger, right, 
the American, which is in this case is symbolic of the chlorine, and the Australian would be symbolic of the chromate. The American just loves burgers, right? So absolutely gonna like demolish those those um burgers, right? And this would one would, would be the silver. So you can see that that the American or the chlorine or the chlorine has a very strong affinity to the silver. But the chromate, I mean, it still likes burgers. I think everyone likes 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 burgers. But um this affinity is less, right? There's less affinity. So if you put them between these two, then the American would definitely gobble up all the burgers. Um, and the Australian, well, I mean, after the, all the Americans are satisfied, then the Australian, you know, they don't, it's not that important to eat the burgers, so they might have some after. They'll eat the burgers after the Americans have, have um, had this. So, when we put in our silver, it'll first directly react with the chlorine, right? It'll first directly react with the chlorine, and it'll form a precipitate. Let's put in our second one. Again, this silver atom... The, the chlorine really wants to eat the silver, not the um, the chromate's kind of chill. So, goes good there. Um, this one goes here with the silver. The next one falls down, reacts with that chloride. And this one falls down and reacts with this chloride. And so, um, oh, there's not enough space. Um, if we kind of shrink these guys a little bit. The, the chlorine and the chromate don't, have not reacted. So we have all these guys um, chilling. I'm just making it a bit smaller so that we have a bit more space. Now, what happens next is that <clears throat> another silver atom comes on, you know, it comes down, and now all the, all the chlorines are full. They don't want any more silvers. Now they can finally react with our chromate. So we're going to actually have two reacting with our chromate. Do, 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 do. Right, and there we go. They react together, and what and what's really interesting is that chromate turns from this yellowy color into a different color. It turns into a red color, right? And then so what happens is as you do this experiment, right? I mean, if you imagine just a few steps ago, right? If if you imagine just a few steps ago. When we have all of our um, silver chloride in solution, we don't know that we've neutralized all the chlorines because we can't see the chlorine atoms, right? For all we know, we should just keep going, keep letting it run, right? But what happens is that the very next drops, in the very few next drops, it turns red. And um, we can see, oh my God, we should totally stop now because we've because we know that if, if this indicator has turned red, then that means that everything else has that, that all the chlorines have been satisfied and it's the cr and we've we've uh, finished reacting with the cr or, or the chloride and then we reacted with the indicator. Okay, let's write that down. Okay. So when the indicator changes color from yellow to red, this this tells us, okay, okay, look, we finished the titration because all the chlorine has been exhausted and now the silver is like, oh, you know, you know there's, you know, it's like, now it's the uh, chromates, CRO4s, that are actually being able to suck away the silvers, okay? So um, that is the basic gist of how a precipitation titration works. We're gonna dive more into the, the details as to why the chromate doesn't, uh, why the silver only reacts with the chromate secondarily in the next video. But uh, we're going to go through a quick example to help make sure that we're confident with this. And then we'll have a look at some of the other methods like the Volhard titration, as well as the Farjant method in separate videos. Let's have a go. Consider you have 90 mils of 0.1 molar NaCl and you want to titrate this with 0.75 molar silver nitrate. Determine how much of the silver nitrate you need. So first, what we can do is we can say, um, you know, how many moles of sodium chloride do I have? Well, let's look at this. CV is equal to um, 0 0.1 times 0 
is equal to 0 0.009 moles of sodium chloride. We know that it's it's a it's a it's a Ag plus Cl, which gives us AgCl solid. So we know that therefore the moles of silver must equal to the moles of chlorine. So if there's 0 0.09 moles of sodium chloride, well, and and you know in every in 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 one sodium chloride, so if there's one mole of sodium chloride, there must be one mole of sodium and one mole of chlorine. So therefore, we can also say that the moles of chlorine is equal to 0 0.009 moles of chlorine. <coughs> So therefore, the moles of silver is also equal to 0 0.009 moles. Great. And what do we do now? Well, now we just need to figure out how much of the 0 0.075 sodium nitrate, uh, uh, silver nitrate, we need. All right. So we have moles equal to CV, moles of um, silver that is, which is equal to what was it? Um, 0 0.075. 0 0.009 times the volume, and the volume would equal to hundred and twenty milliliters. Cool. Hope you guys enjoyed. Watch the next video for some more advanced things on titrations, um, on precipitation titrations, and we'll also be covering the Volhard method as well as the Farchar method. See you guys there. We offer physics, chemistry, and math tutoring. For more insightful explanations like this one, head to tutorgum.com.